All right, welcome to our lecture on modernization model and a little bit about its critics. The slides were originally designed to accompany the textbook People, Places, and Culture, and we use the 10th edition. Um, and I am, of course, your host for the lecture, Ms. Gall. So a few things you need to know before we even start to talk about the model. One is that you need to know it is both the modernization model, that you need to know it is the takeoff model, and you need to recognize that it's Rostos model. Okay. Um, and as we're going through this, look for some linkages that you can kind of see between core and periphery and think a little bit about what role colonialism might play in a model like this. Okay, and um, part of what we're doing in class today is to read an article about colonialism and imperialism. So uh, if you're re-watching the lecture, if you haven't watched the lecture, make sure that you have reviewed that article because it'll help you out understanding some of this. All right, so the underlying assumptions of the model. Assumption number one, all countries follow a similar path to development or modernization. Assumption number two, that both development and modernization are the same things. Okay, and number three, that they go through five distinct stages of development and that every society goes through them in the same order and that once you go forward, you don't go back. Okay, so this is a very forward-looking model. Um, Stage one, society is traditional and the dominant activity is subsistence farming. What that really means is that roughly 85-90% of people are engaged in farming for the sole purpose of supporting their own families. Okay, um, there's a handful of people who do other things, but most people engage in subsistence farming. In Europe and North America, we see this really in Europe up till about depending on exactly where, 1750-ish, maybe as late as 1800 or a little beyond. In the United States, um, we see this all the way up until about 1850, this traditional society, stage one society. Then they start to enter into stage two, what they call preconditions for takeoff. And in this case, what happens is we start to see some new leadership and the leadership starts to move the country towards greater flexibility, greater openness, and more diversification. And really what that means is that you start to see the development more of a factory system, different types of um, labor and uh, things like that. So not as many people are farming. We're starting that shift away from farming, starting that shift more towards urbanization, but it's in it really its early stages. Okay, and in Europe, arguably, this is, you know, again, depending specifically where um, occurring, probably about 1770s, give or take. Um, the United States, you could argue about this really going 1850s and 60s. Um, and then we hit stage three, and stage three is that takeoff. Okay, and it's where the model gets that name takeoff model. But the country experiences something akin to an industrial revolution and that sustained growth starts to take hold. And sustained growth in this case is economic growth. Okay, and industrial revolution means we're moving away from that domination of economic activity as being subsistence farming and more into manufacturing. Okay, so we've got much more manufacturing, manufactured goods going on, much more people are moving into cities, fewer and fewer people are farming. We start to see kind of the birth of commercial farming. Okay, in um, Europe, you can actually, if you look at Britain, you could argue Britain's in takeoff phase as early as 1750. Okay, if you look at some of the um, less developed areas, really this doesn't happen till closer to the 1850. 50s Russia you could even say it doesn't get there until almost the 1880s so it really just kind of depends and the US is in this takeoff phase really kind of post Civil War until um, roughly the turn of the 20th century in the United States okay <clears throat> stage four is the drive to maturity and this is where you start to see the technologies diffuse and spread. We start to see industrial specialization occur, so the development of large factories that are focused on single products or single types of products. And we see an expansion of international trade. Okay, and this is where our, our secondary, our manufacturing becomes very heavily entrenched. Okay, and we also start to see the shift 
to more of a tertiary or service-based sector. Um, international trade expands because the factories become so efficient and so effective at what they're doing that they actually um, make more than the society can consume. And so societies need to trade and that's where, where that international um, trade expansion occurs. In Europe and really in the United States, you see this, this drive to maturity is about the turn of the 20th century to, depending on exactly where, roughly the 1970s. Um, okay. And then the last stage of the model is the age or the age of high mass consumption. And this is where we're at right now. High incomes and widespread production of many goods and services. And what it comes down to, um, mass consumption, really what it means is that it's so cheap to make and buy things that it's actually cheaper to make new things than it is to repair old things. Okay. So if you ask, for instance, um, your parents or more probably your grandparents you know what would happen when they got a hole in their knee when they were a kid odds are good they'd be like my mom or my grandma where they'd say yeah you put a patch on it or you just wear it with the hole right these days it's so cheap to make new things that wearing holes is a fashion statement <laughs> right so um I don't know if that makes sense or not, but what you see at the high mass consumption as well is that there's so many goods and the standard of living is so high that literally what happens is that um, people shift from buying as much stuff and are looking more into not doing the things they don't want to do. And that's where the services come in, right? They pay people to clean their house. They pay people to wash their car, mow their grass, that kind of thing. All right. So when we look at the model a lot of times you'll see it graphed as kind of a ladder of development okay and again this assumes that um, all countries follow the same path and this shows you really two lines and this is where we start to see some of that core periphery float in okay so our x-axis is time because time of course always the independent variable and then the y-axis is stages of progress we go from one to five Okay, our core countries, as you can see by looking at the graph right now, are already up at that um, high mass consumption, right? Um, and no anticipation of going anywhere else. Our periphery societies are reaching, you know, really about stage two. They're getting that preconditions for takeoff in a lot of areas, right? And ultimately, the idea is that they will, we assume, follow the same um, route as Western Europe. If we were going to draw our semi-periphery, it'd be roughly in between the two, and it would be crossing that now line somewhere around, somewhere between stage three and stage four. Okay. <clears throat> By the way, if you haven't included this picture in your notes, you should, because you might very well see it represented this way at some point. So our last slide here, talk a little bit about some of the criticisms of this model. Um, and so criticism number one is that it doesn't take geographical differences very seriously. So it doesn't look at differences in location. It doesn't look at differences in resource availability or populations and doesn't look at that. Why are some places developing more quickly than others? Really, it's a descriptive model. Okay, the conceptualization, the creation of the model of development has a very Western bias which means that it's based on the experiences really of Western Europe and the United States. Okay, so anytime you see that Western bias, that's what I want you to think, Western Europe, United States. Um, and so there's nothing that says other countries are, are going to follow these stages or that they would even want to follow these stages. Okay, um, so that's definitely something to, to think of. It also doesn't talk about whether or not this is a good thing, what we're doing. Uh, and probably the last major criticism of this model is that it doesn't really consider the ability of some countries to influence what happens in other countries. And this is where talking about um, colonialism and imperialism comes into play. Okay, so it doesn't take into account the fact that for some countries, the former colonial power is the people they sell to, right? It's the only people they sell to. Or that when they were a colonial power, they weren't under or when they were a colony, sorry, 
they weren't able to develop themselves the way that they would like to be developed. What they ended up doing was being developed so that another country could basically take advantage of them and rip, rip off their resources. So these are the types of issues um, that this model doesn't take into account. So again, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to come in and ask them. I'd be delighted to answer any questions you can. This has been our, our lecture about the modernization model, um, also called the takeoff model, also called Rostow's model. It is absolutely something you need to know for the test. It runs through five stages, everything from um, traditional society up to the age of mass consumption. And I will look forward to seeing you in class.